Morning, everyone. You hear me all right? Can you? Beautiful morning this morning that we've been blessed with. Honor and a privilege to be here this morning with you. Turned it on. Not this one. Not the screen. Not coming on the screen. No. If you have your Bibles, if you'd like to open to Matthew 28, uh, verses um, 18 to 20. <clears throat> and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So this is Jesus speaking to his disciples just before he went back to heaven. Some people call this passage the Great Commission. Seems like there's a bit of a command or instruction or an imperative in there. And Jesus sort of lays out some of his expectations for his disciples here. Uh, it's true for them back then, and it's true for us now. We're to share the gospel of the resurrected Christ. And if we look at that word, therefore, why are we going to share the word of Christ? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, to Jesus. Go, therefore, and make disciples. We are to be witnesses for Jesus. We are to be ambassadors for Jesus. We are to share that good news that we serve a, a risen Christ. We look at Acts one uh, 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So we're continuing our series now on witnessing, mostly in the book of Acts. And throughout this series, um, we've been posing some questions that hopefully they're in the back of your mind as we go through the series. First of all, what were the apostles witnessing about Jesus? How did they do this? What impact did their witnessing have? What am I meant to be testifying to the world about when I witness? Can people see the changes in me because I am in Christ? Can we think of different ways of witnessing? I mean, Jesus used to tell parables. He used to tell stories. And we all have a story, don't we, if we're a Christian? We all remember how we came to Christ. When was the moment you first realized that the Bible was true? It was God's word. What did that mean to you then? When we explain our faith in a personal experience, it, it can be very effective. Of course, all along we're focusing on God's word at the same time, how that brought us to God. Acts 2, 22, 24. So this is the main patch we'll be focusing on today. Let's begin in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death 
But it was not possible for him to be kept in the grave, or as it says here, to be held by it. So this is Peter's amazing, bold sermon on the day of Pentecost. And this is the Peter who wanted to meet Jesus on the water. He walked on the water and started to sink. And Jesus saved him and said, ye of little faith. This is the same Peter who denied Jesus three times, not that long before. Just prior to this passage, Peter quotes a passage from the prophet Joel. It talks about the Spirit being poured out on people. It talks about signs and wonders and the great and glorious day of the Lord. But that's not enough for Peter. He wants to more fully explain the gospel message. He wants to talk about Jesus in more detail, to present the gospel message and how to be saved. And he goes on to do that, doesn't he? And he does it with amazing boldness. He's talking to what he's saying. You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. Could he be more blunt? Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. Many of them were witnesses to the things that Jesus did. Many of them would have seen the miracles, heard his teaching. And those that didn't probably would have heard about it. I'm sure they would have talked, spoken a lot about Jesus and what he did. Verse 24, God raised him up, losing the pangs, sometimes pains, pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So this word pangs in the Greek often refers to the pains of childbirth. The grave could not hold Jesus just as though, just like the pregnant mother cannot hold the baby. It's inevitable. It was not possible to be, for him to be held in the grave. And that's why we're here today. Peter quotes Psalm 16, 18 to 11. Acts 20, uh, 2, 25, he says, For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, and I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you make me full of gladness with your presence. David trusts God that he, God will not abandon his soul the same way that God will not abandon Jesus. It was Jesus that rose from the dead, not David. I've heard things said, it's a bit of an aside, that when Jesus died, he was somehow separated from God the Father and the Holy Spirit. That was true, and I don't think it was. How could that be? Isn't Jesus the Holy Spirit and God the Father all God? How can God be separated from God? I don't understand that. It's just something to think about. It says here, you see, the corruption means that Jesus' body would not be left in the grave to decay. Jesus overcame death, was resurrected, and seen by many witnesses. Acts 2.29, as we continue. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us today. He died and was buried. He's not Jesus. Being therefore a prophet, knowing that God had, had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we're all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. You 
you yourselves are seeing and hearing. If you're going to witness to someone and they say, well, how would you know? You weren't there. How can you be a witness? Just think about that for a moment and I'll get to it. Yep. Acts 2, 34 to 37. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make my enemies your footstools. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? It wasn't David that was going to ascend into heaven. David wasn't the Messiah. It was Jesus who conquered death. It was Jesus who came down from heaven. It was God and man at the same time. It was Jesus who lived this perfect life, who exuded love in all the things he did, patience and kindness and, and correction at times. And he was the one willing to give up his life. He was the one that was murdered, put in that grave, and rose again in three days. In Acts 2.40, I sort of find this interesting because when you read, a lot of times when you read the Bible, speech, you know, talks and things like that are abridged. This is a short form that doesn't give you the whole story. And it says here, and with many other words, he, continued, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. You know, you sort of read Peter's sermon and so, wow, that's all I've got to do. Just get out there. We have to be patient. As it says here, many words it takes. It can take a long time to bear witness, to explain what you want to explain, to get where people are beside you to explain it, to show them in your life as a witness. When we preach Christ crucified, we're asking people to make profound changes in their life, in their minds, in their action. And as you know, when we become a Christian, it's a bit like God giving this, these spiritual glasses. We put them on and everything looks a bit different. Everything in one way or another. And he expects us to have a godly transformation. And as we change and become more Christ-like, Christianity might seem, in fact, to seem a bit normal. A normal supernatural life. It's not normal at all, really. And I think for me, I tend to forget about that. I tend to forget about how profound it is and how God has changed me until I speak to someone who perhaps isn't interested. <laughs> or who thinks so differently that I do, not because of me, but because what God has taught me. He had made us different. If you're witnessing someone and they ask, well, how has Christianity changed you? What would you say? Can they see it in you? As I said, a Christian life is a supernatural life. We believe in God. That's supernatural. We believe, we have the audacity to believe that the Son of God, Jesus, came in this earth, was crucified, rose again, went back to heaven, is alive now, intercedes for us, abides with us. That's pretty supernatural stuff, isn't it? We've been made holy, we've been sanctified. Our prayers are ancient seated for us, and we look forward to that certain day when Jesus returns. Yeah. This passage I find very interesting because 
Again, the Bible gives us an abridged, a shortened version of what Jesus did. It says here, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did, were every one of them to be written, I suppose the, the world itself could be not contain the books that would be written. That's a lot of stuff. Now, is this a bit of exaggeration? I don't know. Whatever, however much Jesus did, it was a huge amount of things. And it means that it must have been many, many more witnesses to what he was doing, confirming who he was. And next one. So we were supposed to have a discussion time. So I'll just throw out some questions that we were going to look at. First of all, how has Christ changed me? In what ways becoming a disciple of Christ affected my life? Can people see the changes in my life? Can we think about different ways of witnessing? Next one. And I guess the you know, the one thing, well, there's many things, but the main thing that jumps out at me with Peter is his boldness. Can you imagine that? Standing in front of these people, many of whom would have been involved in crucifying Christ. You might fret for your life. But he was bold, filled with the Spirit, and he proclaimed it. So one more passage, the last one, the Hebrews passage. So I asked you, if someone asked you, well, you weren't there. You didn't witness Jesus. How could you know? You know? Isn't this our best witness? The word of God. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 4. For the word of God is living and active. Somehow, not the pages, the binder, the Word of God is active. And I like it. It's, it's living, yes, but it's active as well. It's working. I think it's one of these things you sort of know what it means, but you don't know what it means. It's so profound. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit. And that's an interesting distinction, soul and spirit. That's another lesson, perhaps of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When we're witnessing to someone and we're sharing the Bible, you know, it's, we just have to share the Bible and give our story and help them look at God's doing, going to do the rest. I think we tend to forget about it, how living and active and and if it touches the right heart and open mind, it transforms. So Christians live under the authority of the Bible. We believe it's God's word. We believe it's authoritative. We believe it's true. And we believe it's relevant. God's living and active word alongside your story can be very effective in witnessing. And that's it today. Thanks for your attention.